Today's giveaway, MAPS Powerlift. That's what we're going to give away today, MAPS Powerlift. This is the MAPS program specifically designed to help you improve and increase your lifts, your squat, your bench press, your deadlift, the three biggest lifts in barbell training. So it's a great program. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. You got to do all those things. If we like your comment and we pick your comment among all the comments, we'll notify you and you get free access to that incredible workout program. One more thing before we get to this incredible episode. And let me tell you, this episode is one of the best episodes we've ever done in our entire lives. I could say that with full confidence. You're going to love this one. We are running a sale this month right now. So it's going to end at the end of November. So if you'd like to take advantage, check out Maps Anywhere. That's a, a workout you can do anywhere, just resistance bands in your body, but it's a great muscle building, metabolism boosting program. We also have a Fit Mom Bundle, which includes Maps Anywhere, Maps Anabolic, Maps Hit. That's three workout programs, plus the intuitive nutrition guide that helps you with your diet. So you got all those things in the bundle already discounted, take an additional 50% off. So it's a huge promotion. If you're interested, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com, click on one of those two programs or program bundles, and then use the code NOVEMBER50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. Hey, today's fit tip has to do with rest periods. Longer rest periods build more muscle and shorter rest periods build more muscle. So how do you know which one to pick for you? Well, here's the secret. It's the one that's novel. The one that you're not doing is probably the one that you're going to respond best to. All right. Thoughts on that one, guys? What do you guys think? Do you think this is of all the things that you can manipulate, tempo, rest period sets? Do you think this is one of the things that's least manipulated or most manipulated? I think it's looked over constantly. Totally. Yeah. Totally looked over. Yeah. I think people look at adding weight, then they'll change uh, the exercises. That's a common one. Um, rarely do, maybe tempo. That's also kind of rare. And then rest periods, people tend to rest the same amount per set. Uh, or kind of get that same feel of rest per set, regardless of what their goals are. And that's what I think happens. I think it's uh, less that people are, are stuck in 90 second or two minute or right at 30 second only, is that everybody gets into their kind of flow of how they train. Yep. And no matter what the exercises are, no matter what the tempo, no matter what they're doing their sets, they just kind of go through the same flow as they train. And I think you get stuck in a, a time. So when I recommend for somebody to change uh, their rest periods, I first kind of like the nutrition thing, uh, track just for a week, just pay attention, yep. you know, and have a stopwatch in your pocket or next to you and see what you you see yourself averaging and get an idea from there and then go away from that. And I like to go as far, as far away from that as possible from one extreme to the other so you can see the, the greatest change or difference from it. Yeah, I find one of the most difficult clients uh, with this is our type A or, or you know, yeah, uh, the clients that, that all want to go, 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 and they're based on momentum. And uh, you know, th th like you said, they're just getting into kind of the flow of the workout, but uh, they want to get right back into it and think that more is always better and to just like cram it all in uh, versus like, what what's what are you actually trying to achieve? And, and to actually like focus on strength takes that adequate amount of rest to stay in that energy system. Yeah. You know, and it, what's confusing is when you look at studies, right? St they've done studies on rest periods and they do find and here's the trouble with studies, by the way. The, the trouble with studies is they're typically eight weeks or 12 weeks or 16 weeks. So in a 16-week period, if we compare rest period to rest period, it is true that longer rest periods, two and a half minutes, three minutes, tends to build more strength and muscle than, let's say, a 30-second or 45-second rest period. But the problem with that is it's a short study. It doesn't look long-term. And we don't look at the – we don't examine the novelty effect because in my experience, and I'm sure lots of coaches will agree – if you always rest three minutes and then you do some workouts where you're resting 45 seconds in between sets, you're going to see some change in the body. It's totally new. Brand it's new totally stimulus. Novel. It is. I experienced it this morning. Now, so for me, my rest periods are dictated often by how much time I have to work mm -hmm. out. And this morning I came to work and I figured, okay, I can be here by like 8, 10 and I'll have till 9, 30. I'm going to do a, lot, a high volume workout and take my time a little bit. And well, anyway, on the way here, my son is like, oh crap, I forgot my notes for class and I have a test where we can look at our notes. So I had to make a U-turn, go all the way back. Anyway, I got here at 8.40 and I needed to finish by like 9.20. So I did 35 sets, okay? So I trained my whole upper body, lots of volume in that short period of time. My rest periods were like 30 seconds. Totally different feel, but because I was forced to do that, I, I mean, at the end of it, I was like, wow, this was a great, and I can tell when I have a good workout, something that's gonna you know work for me. 
It was phenomenal, but it's because it was novel. No, now this is this is the way that I manipulate recipes. The same exact way. I, I after training for as long as we all have, uh, it, it just makes sense to manipulate what, based off of what makes the most sense because of your schedule. And I mm -hmm. think it's a perfect time to intermittently play with these things. That being said. If you're listening to this and you're somebody who's never really manipulated your rest periods, my recommendation is to figure out first what you're currently doing. Yeah. Choose something that is the polar opposite. So if you're a short rest period person, go the extreme long rest periods. If you're a long rest period person, go to the extreme short period and then do it for all exercises for two to three weeks so you can actually measure and yeah. see a difference. Because a lot of times I give advice like this or talk about it and then someone goes, oh, okay. So then like an exercise or two, they decide to do that or they do it for one workout and then they go back to their old behaviors and they're like, oh, I really didn't know much difference. Or they get discouraged because they shorten the rest periods and they're weaker. And so they freak out because it's like, oh, I feel weaker, so I don't want to do that. But whatever it is that you decide to do, you know, be consistent with it across the board, stick to it for two to three weeks so that your body can then see the adaptation and change. Well, that's from it. definitely a good example though. Like uh, a lot of times you you'll feel like I'm weaker. And so like my load, I have to adjust, but you just have to go and knowing that, you know, it's a different, it's a different type of, uh, you know, focus going into that type of a workout where you're now you're shortening the rest period. So yes, certain things are going to be affected by that in terms of like how much load you want to you want to add uh, versus like being able to maintain composure and do quality reps yeah. each time. Yeah, you're not gonna you're not gonna lift as much weight when you're resting 30 seconds. By the way, use a stopwatch if you really want to do this, because what you'll find is if you don't use a stopwatch, you'll tend to move back into kind of what you're used to, and maybe you're shortened a little bit, but not like what you're used to. Or if it's the opposite, if you're used to short rest periods, it may feel like you rested two minutes, but really you didn't. Take a stopwatch when you do this. Time yourself and then go at the 40 second mark or the 60 or the 90 or whatever your your new rest period is keep it consistent that way totally different feel and because it's novel right because it's new and this is true for most i think factors with 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 your training if it's new it'll probably work at least in the short term right it'll probably cause some positive change in the short term mm -hmm. but nothing works forever so then you kind of you know repeat the cycle Anyway, speaking yep. of kids, so that was annoying this morning, right? So, and by the way, when I went to go bring my son back home to get his his notes, I'm stuck in like school traffic. So every single slow driving mom in a minivan is in front of me, and I'm like just trying to stay calm. Like, oh my gosh, this is taking so. Anyway, so that happened. But I also my other kid, my one year old, you know, they talk about the terrible twos, the terrible threes. Uh, he's obviously advanced because he's one <laughs> and he's already gotten to getting into that really terrible Dude, Unos. You know what, what, you, uh, what are you noticing right now? So, I mean, it's not too bad, but I'm, I'm mostly joking, but he did this thing to Jessica. It was absolutely hilarious. So he was sitting down and she was giving him food and he was just being a pill and screaming and he's found his voice. He likes to scream real loud. He thinks it's funny, but it's super, it's not very cool to be next to. And he's screaming and he's taking food and he's smashing it. And then you know, she's like, all right, you're done. I'm going to clean you up. And he doesn't want her to wipe his face. So she'll take his hand to wipe it. He'll take his other hand and just wipe the food in his hair. <laughs> and then she'll wipe that one. And then he'll do it again on the other side. And it was just back and forth. And she's like, he would not let me clean them. He kept rubbing food in his face the whole Dude, time. I mean, and it, it's frustrating, but it's such a funny face, oh, yeah. right? Like that part, like I remember my kids going through that and then they'd look at you like, and you'd be like, no, 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 put, put that spoon down, put that bowl down. And they just look at you and then they go. just dump it yeah, right, <laughs> right, while right on themselves oh <laughs> and you're just like why oh it's hilarious dude he gets so he'll get mad and then i think it's adorable I, this was my older kids too when they're that little and they get pissed off and they're frustrated i think it's like cute so i'll go and i'll pick them up and squeeze them which yeah. makes them even matter yeah so it's it's kind of a fun game what's the uh what's the sleep routine look like for you guys right now like what's his like get ready for bed like obviously he's still in in the crib you guys haven't transitioned from that no. like what's his what's his sleep look like right now he's improved tremendously so his evening sleep now is pretty damn good although he wakes up at 6 or 6 30 no matter what time he goes to bed which is interesting but it's pretty good but the routine typically is so we use um I don't know if you guys have heard that the hatch lights. Have you guys seen these? Mm. Okay, so they there's they, there's a light that changes colors, and what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to associate that with like we're getting ready for bed, or it's time to be in bed, mm. right, mm. or time to get up. So we use like there's a green color that we use, and green means we're in the crib and we're hanging out and playing and we're getting ready for bed. And so I, I 
switch the light on, put him in there. And it's anywhere between, depending on how tired he is, I'll do, we'll do five to 15 minutes of playing in the crib. So you're basically getting him super chill and relaxed yeah. and comfortable with bed. And then without him re realizing, you switch the light to red. So then it turns on red and then white noise comes on. And they're like, oh, it's time to clean up your toys and time to get ready for bed. And then you, he helps you clean and then you lay him down. And it works really well. It actually works you know, pretty good and he goes right to sleep. So you guys, he actually gets a little bit of play time in his crib before he goes down. Yeah, at least five minutes, I would oh, say. Okay. At least five sure. minutes. So just in, And that was a recommendation from some sleep experts. I guess it helps the child like be comfortable in bed and whatever. So. Well, it makes sense. I mean, it's a similar process, right, that we're doing. We're only doing that with, uh, like, so we're in the opposite room that's attached to his. So we have, a, we have two rooms that have a Jack and Jill bathroom between each other. And we use, and it's a spare room for us, but we also use that as his, this is his room to calm down. Like he's not allowed to get off the bed. We read to him, the lights like super low and dim. So it's kind of Amber like look inside the room. And we spend probably 20, sometimes 30 minutes uh, reading and just kind of talking with him, but it's like just bringing him all the way down. Yeah. And then during that time, Katrina and I will reach over, grab our phone, turn on the hatch. So you can actually hear the, the rain, the white noise. Mm -hmm kick on and that room's actually already pitch black and everything. And then we walk him in, we use our little foam for light and walk him over to the bed and say, okay, get into bed. And he gets in the bed. Katrina actually lets him do this thing. I didn't even know she did this. Uh, she lets him carry a toy to the bed, but then when he gets in the bed, he has to hand her the toy and then he lays down. Um, and I didn't know she was doing that. Like, cause when I put him to bed, I don't do that. And I was like, you're letting him carry the toy to bed. Aren't you worried? She's like, no, no, he, he hands it to me. And I watched him on the camera. I was like, oh, it's so cute. She gets him in, he climbs in the bed and then you see her do this. And then he hands the toy and then he lays down and does this thing. The hardest thing right now for us to break, or I'd say her more so her, cause I started already is the, uh, letting him hold on to you forever. So like, oh, like he wants to hold your hand. While yeah. He wants to hold his hand while oh, he's yeah. falling asleep. And you know, mm. that's cute. And it was very cute at the very beginning, but it's like, at, <laughs> if you, like how do I slip out? Yeah. <laughs> and it, and if he's like, <laughs> if he's fading and he feels you pull away, put some Vaseline he, on your hands. He gets startled and he, when he wakes, sits up. So I now like I get him in there and I won't let him do that. I I'll sit in the bed like this where it's it's pitch black, but there's an you know we have the little what's it little guard rail so he doesn't yeah. fall over. He can exit on the left. He can exit on the right. And I'm long enough that I can sit off and I do this like with your legs. Yeah, with my legs and my arms, and I'm doing just a silent game where I'm just waiting. And I can tell if he tries to get off the You're bed. The goalie. Yeah, I, <laughs> I boom, I dink him back. No, 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 lay down. And I don't say anything unless he's trying to have no, no, back to bed. You know, and I do that until he lays himself down because if I let him hold me, he puts like a death Dude, grip on that. Do you finger. know they they uh, make yeah. they make these like onesie blankets that have a, like they're weighted a little bit and they'll they'll put like a a little bit of weight in one part of the back of it whatever because it simulates your hand being on the baby's back because that's a common thing so we have a really heavy uh gravity type blanket really really heavy that like, the only downfall with that and this is the the challenge i have is that Katrina doesn't let me get it as cold as I would like it in the room. She's like, it's too cold in there. His hands are freezing. You know, so mo protective mom bear comes out and I'm like, no, nah, he kicks off the covers because he's too hot. I'm like, you got him in a full, full outfit. And then it's, does he run hot like you or, or you I cold? think so. Yeah. It's, this is, this is one of the, the in battles at home right now is that mm. I'm like, let the kid be colder. You know what I'm saying? Let it be cool. I mean, I, Here's what I look for. Like, I if he's cold, you, they do this thing where they, you know, they ball up and yeah. he tucks his hands and feet. I'm like, okay, well, then he's cold. I said, but if he's sprawled out and opened up, he's probably he's hot. hot. Yeah. And then we have this heavy gravity blanket to do that. And you put it on him and he's just like, nah, <laughs> he kicks yeah. it off of him. So he, I can't do that or else that would work really well. So yeah, no, did you guys no. do the the sleep suit? It was like a sleep sack. Yeah. Well, it's like a like a full on. He looks like the marshmallow man. Yes. Yeah. yeah did yeah, you guys yeah. do that? Something similar to that. We oh, did. Okay. We don't do that anymore. Now he's just he, he's a hot kid too, like your son. So yeah. we put him in, and we have to make sure the room is relatively cool because otherwise he starts to sweat and he's, he doesn't do very well. I think that's common, by the way. I think it's common for parents to over cover their kids. Yeah. Cause they're afraid that they're, yeah. you know, and it's like, and they and can't he feels feel little you. fingers and she thinks it's, you know, cause it is his fingers or his hands feel super cold or whatever. And I'm like, honey, it's, you know, 70 degrees in there. He's not cold. Yeah, yeah. I promise. Dude, it's funny. You guys remember, cause we just got into thermostat wars <laughs> oh, and God. I didn't know like, cause I've already had this with 
Courtney. And then when I, whenever we go on vacation or her sister comes with us, like me and her sister have fierce battles over the uh, thermostat. <laughs> and it's like, it's a, and I get it. Cause like she'll, a lot of times she'll like use the couch or the guest room or something where it's more drafty. And then I like it really cold. And so I try to keep it somewhere in the middle. And then I know in the middle of the night, she'll turn it down and I'll come up and I'll turn it back to, you know, I'll give you the move to down. I got the move for you, dude. Huh? Just come out and just get a glass of water or something naked. Well, it's, it's, it's yeah. super hot. This this ha- sorry, it's so hot. I got this to has to be <laughs> this has to be one of the most common uh, husband and wife battles. Totally, you know? just there's very few things that Katrina and I like really battle about. Like if I had say there's like if someone made me pick like what if you guys argued about something or disagree the most on it's the temperature in yeah. the house. Yeah. It is the that's a that's a that's a male is, female we're, thing. We're just for sure. completely different animals, and uh, you know. But the, why I bring that up is because now my kids are are messing with it, and like they hadn't figured that out yet. But all of a sudden, like because it's right outside like Everett's door, so he just he'll turn it to like seventy, and I'm just like oh, just sweltering. And I'm like, pal, you like you cannot touch this. Dude. Yeah. I just got to like set boundaries. Dude, my dad would have thrown you no. Know, yeah. There's no way you can touch. If this. I touched when I was a kid, if I touched the thermostat left the refrigerator door open or left a light on in a yeah. room that wasn't being used. Oh boy. See, we oh, used yeah. to get the same shit too, like big time. Like that was like a big fight in our house when we were growing up, but it was for money reasons. Like yeah. if we ran the heater or the A, it wasn't about, t- like for me, it's all about temperature. It's not about, oh, that cost us a dollar more to run that. It's that. <laughs> yeah. throw, they're like, throw on another jacket. Yeah, <laughs> except my, when we totally. were kids, my my stepdad would get pissed if we manipulated the heater or the AC because it was running. It was just like, you know, you don't let it run during the night. It's wasting money for us to do that. So if you were freezing in the winter time and you wanted the heater on, he'd freak out. If it was the opposite, it was the summertime, you want the AC on, he'd freak out. So it wasn't about keeping his temperature. He was just like, that's costing us money yeah. so yeah. same thing with the light you know that was like where we got that all the well, time. it's just novel right now because i used to keep uh them they were downstairs and it's you know the, the downstairs at my old house was all cinder block and it's like really like like it's an ice chamber and they used to sleep uh, and they get good sleep down. I, I feel like they got better sleep at my old house because now it's like it's it's novel and they can kind of manipulate every now and then when i'm not looking and so yeah, it's been a battle, dude, with these kids. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. But my 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 youngest is also looks like he's got some favorite toys, and right now one of his favorite things to do is push things across the floor. So we got I, I talked about yesterday the, the other day, right? He, that he has that kind of walker thing yeah. that he pushes. He's starting to add little bits of load to it. Or he, he he likes to push things around, yeah. and and you know I tell you. I think, I think the third time's a charm. Like my dream was always to have a kid that was a fanatical about working out like me and that kind of stuff. And my older kids, they're not really fanatical about it, which is fine. But I think the baby is because he's he'll push things that he can't move and he'll sit there and then he'll apply strength. He'll like and start to do it. And I'm oh, like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> push that thing, son. Let's do this. You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, dude, he picks things up. Yeah. Oh, and I'm like, this is going to be great. I hope he's into working out the because training begins. we're going to have a good time. Hey, you know what I've been meaning to ask, Justin, you, you haven't given us an update on that one show that you were so excited about. Are you following Foundation? it still? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've been watching. I like it. I like Consistently? it Consistently? Yeah. Oh yeah. I've heard yeah, you it's say like every Friday it. they'll drop one. Um, and it's, it's really good. It's it's more like of a drama than necessarily sci-fi action sci-fi. It's it is sci-fi. It's definitely sci-fi, but it's it's more of like a drama. And um, I guess I like it a lot. Like I like the concept of it. So it's just kind of different, like than what I was expecting. But it's still a really good show. You guys oh, okay. haven't seen it yet. I yeah. haven't. I, haven't I watched, watched the first episode and it like kind of pulled me in a little bit but there's a lot of good tv on right now and so it just kind of fell on the list and i and katrina asked me last night she said did we not ever finish that one sci-fi one you really want to watch i said yeah you know justin got me all excited about it and then i haven't heard him say a single word about it since then so that it's just not in my rotation it's like i got other things to catch i'm behind on a bunch of stuff it's super trippy i mean the concept is is really cool with the whole lineage being these clones and like how like some of the uh the different um uh, like the, the different cultures around the universe or whatever, like contest and think, and they're, they're finding out that they're clones. And so like, they're, they're basically like, they don't have souls. Right. And so this is like a, an argument amongst them that um, anyways, it, it gets, it gets far out there in terms of like uh, some, some like semblance of like, what is a soul? And then also like the whole algorithm thing of being able to predict all these events that are going to occur and, 
Um, so it's it's definitely a thinking show. Dude, speaking of cloning and stuff like that, I am seeing more and more articles start to come out. So sometimes you can see the the tide from a distance and you can kind of predict the direction it's moving. And I am reading more and more articles that are making the argument that genetically modifying humans is going to be a really good thing. In fact, I just read one this weekend and it was making the case about why we should genetically modify humans, why why that's, a, that's not a bad thing and why that's going to benefit us and all that kind of stuff. Mm. So I'm going to read to you some of the reasons why they said it's a good idea. Now, this was a blog. But like I said, I'm seeing more and more of these articles. I'm reading them in science journals. I'm well, reading- I think about, you know, selfishly, imagine if you could give me something that would, you know, rewrite my code for my psoriasis. Like going, if you could take something that would, would change that. Obviously, your, your, your crazy conspiracy mind goes right away. Like, this doesn't sound good. We're going to have the old, but on a, on a much smaller scale, but very impactful for people. It's like, imagine you could do something to change autoimmune. Well, so, okay. So the argument starts with, we could cure genetic issues. And by the way, this is about editing a baby before it's born, not editing your genes while oh. you're alive. This is like, we're going to create, we're going to take your genes, pick the best ones, and then right. that's the kid that like, you're going to have. We have control. We'll go ahead and play God. And And initially it's like, yes, we can solve lots of genetic issues and make sure your kid doesn't have predispositions to particular things or solve autoimmune issues or high risk type of stuff. But then the argument very quickly goes into, for example... We could adjust genes to create regeneration in the body. So your kid loses a hand grows in an back. accident, but they have this modification where the hand will grow back. Right? Here's another one. The ability to resist the negative emotional, psychological, and physical effects of graveyard shifts. Like there's genes that we could tweak to make it so that you could work at night off the circadian rhythm and not have such negative That's wild. effects. Here's another one. The ability to identify a person from a mile away. So having what? the ability to, and and this is actually, we've seen this in specific individuals. There's one person in particular, Veronica Sider. She's got this particular ability where she could recognize a face from a mile away. Here's another one. The ability to solve math good problems. From far, far from good. Yeah. You ever heard that? Uh, the ability to solve math problems at lightning speed. Now, here's my issue with all this stuff. So get, the argument's like, oh, it'll be cool. We'll have superpowers essentially and whatever. You know what the problem's going to be? People are going to do all this expecting it's going to make their life, it's going to make them happier and improve their quality and, and the meaning of their life. And they're going to discover very quickly that that's not the answer. Just yeah. like we are now with all the stuff that we have well, and the con- fact that we don't starve. Consequences give purpose. It's it's such a strange um, thing, isn't it? Like, did this, was this stem from, did you look at Joe Rogan's post he just did a few days ago? Did you see that post? No, I didn't Oh see it. yeah, maybe you could pull up Joe Rogan's thing. He It was along this line, but he was talking more about the likelihood of, um, you know, humans being like cyborgs, like that's the reality of that is becoming more and more real every day that that's what we're most likely going to see in the, the nearest future is people being able oh, to- Oh, along those lines, they have devices right now where they can in, do an implant in your brain or in your body. And essentially it's a pleasure implant. So you could activate this thing and feel good like feel pleasure or even become sexually aroused in orgasm from pushing. See, but there's, there's got to be some unintended consequences to that. Like their bodies then would probably downregulate its natural production of things like, I mean, it's just like, it's no or it different. loses its effect. Or it's, right. Or, it's, or it's more pleasurable. Yeah. Than actually having. Sex, yeah. Well, think right? about it this way. It's like eating. Okay. Here's a good one. Eating uh junk food or hyper hyper palatable sweets. Right. How much more meaningful and enjoyable is it when you n- almost never eat those things, but then you enjoy them occasionally versus mm-hmm. I eat them every single day? So maybe something along those lines. Yeah. But even if there weren't any of those effects, I think people are going to find out very quickly that they're going to get all the stuff and then they're going to be like, but I'm still not happy. Mm-hmm. It's like lottery winners or, you know, so long as your your basic needs are, net, uh, needs are met, you find out very quickly that this is not... I'm even more depressed now because now I have all the stuff and I have this body and I'm tall and I can see far away and, but I'm still, I feel empty. I still feel sad. Like what's going on? But we're always just looking to solve problems, you know? And even when the problems aren't there, we create problems so we can solve them again. I don't know (laughs) why we're so addicted to that. Uh, We're addicted to feelings. Uh, that's what it is. Well, I mean, isn't that the that's the natural progression of evolution, though, too, right? Is to constantly be improving, adapting, improving, adapting, improving, adapting, and so 
we've just we've come so far today that we're not now we're trying to solve and change these things that you would have thought was unsolvable but it, with science it's looking like it's not going to be and then the question will be uh did you know did we we get what we want did we really want that um, but I like right away, I think our minds always go to the like conspiracy theory or the, yeah. like, the worst case scenario. I'm sure we're missing a lot of things that uh, like it will solve that are like very basic without any really crazy consequences. Right away, your brain goes the most extreme. It's like there's probably some very subtle things that it's you that know why science you can help. argue that I'm sure they had a hard time dealing with like organ transplants and, you know, certain like medical procedures back in the day that uh were probably deemed like you're playing God right. back then, right? Hundred percent. So it's like a perspective thing of like where we are right now in terms of technology and like what we can do to improve. Bro, I that's such a good point that you got to think that there was a time when somebody the fact that we could go in and open somebody's heart and fix a valve <laughs> or change something to give you know to give them life again practically is playing God and that there was probably a, a group of people that thought. We shouldn't be doing this, and this is unnatural. No, no, I don't. So I'm not making that argument, right? I think okay. Give you an example: um, myostatin inhibitors or hormone type stuff, right? Hugely beneficial for people with like muscle wasting disease, but very easily abused by athletes and people who want to push the limits or whatever. Uh, opiates, right? Incredibly powerful pain relievers, also abused by people who. Don't want to have any bad feelings and it can cause a lot of problems. So I think genetic, you know, modifications, I mean, yeah, we could prevent children from being paralyzed and having genetic, you know, well, diseases and blindness and stuff like that. I think that's great. But it's going to be, I'm, I know you know, human nature, we are not going to stop there. It's well, going to that, start I to mean, go well, 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 isn't it like some, like, so an example being like uh, that sort of gene that helped to, um, combat malaria yeah and, but but also contributed to sickle cell oh right so like there that's true it, it's like maybe we did solve that but then we created you know some unintentional consequence of that like as a result of us manipulating what was already natural yeah and i mean just to stick to fitness if if we could snap our fingers and make everybody lean and fit and muscular would they derive the same benefit as as if they had achieved that themselves through the discipline, the work, and the personal growth that is required to do that stuff? And I would argue all day long, no. They would get some benefit. They feel better, right? They, they look better, all that stuff. But it's not gonna, it's going to pale in comparison to what you would gain from the process mm -hmm. of getting there in the first place. So that's always going to be the challenge. But I mean, yeah. at some point, I think we'll figure that out. So I got some uh, more scary things out of Australia. <laughs> this should be like a whole segment. I mean, we talked about spiders. We've talked Dude, about crazy every, crocodiles. Everything's poisonous over there. Everything, right? So uh, there's this specific plant, uh, and I'm going to try and remember. It's the gimpy gimpy plant. So it's also the called gimpy. the suicide plant that that is there. And I just found out about this. It apparently has like these little thorn, like not thorn, but like needle like little hairs um, that if if one of them actually like sticks into you, They've compared it to um, basically like a hot acid burn and being electrified, uh, electrocuted at the same time. Wow. That's the, the level of pain that gets inflicted. And some, for some people, it can like last for years. What? Wow. Can you, yeah. Doug, can I see a picture of this plant? I want to see what this thing wow. looks like. I was like, this is crazy. Like, isn't that, isn't now, that weird? That you have horrible. You have one massive, I don't know, you know, country or whatever that's just water all around it. And it, it, all the animals evolved. To be poisonous and dangerous for yeah. some reason, yeah. and then you have like Hawaii like, like extra, and then you, know? you have Hawaii. There's now there's certain animals. There's lots of animals and plants in Hawaii that were brought from other people, but the original native, like there were, there's not a single poisonous animal. Is that true? Yeah, really. There's, oh yeah. Why do you think pigs ro yeah. go yeah, chickens? Yeah, or chickens free. and pigs. We brought them there and they went crazy. They have no no natural predators. I didn't know that. That's really mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Like, why would that be? Right? Why would there, why would a plant like this evolve? To be this because you have too. to to survive in Australia, you got to be a badass. You got some you kind got, of a crazy. That's what it looks I mean, like right there. You're, you're fighting governments yes. now. You're fighting everything yeah, out the, there. Dentro dentrosnide or dent, dentrocnide. I don't know how to pronounce it. Mor moroides is the name of the plant. And those are the little hairs. Man, it's not just one. You're gonna get hit with a bunch of them. Yeah, read yeah. me a little bit about the plant. Like, yeah. what is, and even if it, the wind blows, it could blow one of those on you and still stick oh, you. It's from the nettle family. 
Did oh those stinging nettles? If you go down to the creeks, we used to get that all the time, and it you know cause a rash. And so like the stinging leaves tr leaves trigger an intense allergic reaction in its victims, sometimes even causing anaphylactic shock. The sting can cause excruciating, deliberating pain for months. Yeah. People have variously described it as feeling as they're being burned by acid, electrocuted, or squashed by giant hands. <laughs> what? <laughs> squashed by giant hands? <laughs> you imagine? Uh, ah, yeah. You're sitting there, the doctor's uh, like, describe your pain to me. You're like, ah. uh, imagine giant hands squishing yeah, you. Like Robert Oberst was just squashing the shit I'm out still of chipping Here's out on the idea that there is all this in Australia and then none of that in Hawaii. I think yeah. that's really interesting. That's so weird. It's weird, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, why? Why on that, why on that island but not the other one? And I wonder how how is I wonder if this is all over the place. Like the how shitty is it? that plant doesn't look that crazy or scary. It's you, cute. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. even have known. Like that's the thing. It's right. Like, what if you just like walk by and ah, yeah. Like, dude, I I don't know how I would react to that. No, no, no. I wouldn't, that would that would that would, <laughs> that would suck. <laughs> ah, really, really bad. Yeah. Hey, speaking of things that suck, yeah. uh, inflation going <laughs> out of control. Oh, this isn't a good thing. No, it's okay. going crazy, and you're and we're seeing we're, it's continuing to break records. We're and, on a thirty year all time uh, high. Bro, right do you know now. how annoying crazy. this is? Okay, uh, when you hear th these political leaders come out <laughs> and say the most stuff that makes me so infuriated, like, "Oh, it's because <laughs> Americans are just buying too much stuff." Okay, that makes me really <laughs> pissed off because that's that's hilarious. Or it's price gouging. The reason why prices are going up is because businesses are taking advantage of people, which is also um, extremely annoying or that, oh, this is transient. It's not going to, it's going crazy. It is exploding. Now uh, on the flip side, it's got to be, this has to be an incredible opportunity for subscription-based model companies like uh, public goods, mm -hmm. right? Because they're so low priced and they've eliminated so many middlemen that they're probably positioned better to navigate this inflammatory, this inflationary, you know, kind of environment than other companies. You know, it's interesting too, because I know uh, ButcherBox hasn't had any real problems yeah, either. Right. And I've been waiting for some of our partners to reach out to us and, uh, you know, either pull back commercials or see if there's something we could work out because of supply chain issues. But I haven't heard anything from any of our, now most of our partners are direct to consumer. So well, I, I I think public goods is yeah. I think this is an opportunity. Those are probably the best models right now in this time. Well, don't yeah. you think they still would be affected by supply chain of issues course, the same way? Of course, but they because there's so many less players. Because here's the deal. Let's say you're you you have you have your manufacturing done over here, and then you got to ship it over there, and then you got your buyers in your retail stores, mm -hmm. and then those retail stores have to mark it up as well. And along that, there's a whole supply chain situation going on versus public goods. That which, makes sense because it's direct to consumers. So you're cutting out a few of the middlemen. And if it's a supply chain issue, I'm sure that- it, Or packaging, you know, yeah. or and they have like the, the, the way that they package their products, it's like very reusable. And so I, I would imagine they're positioned better. So there's going to be some winners and losers coming out of this. I was just area. online ordering more stuff. I, you know yeah, what? Slowly but surely right they have, they have taken over my entire house. Like every time there's like a product that we have that we like run out of, I always, I've now learned to just ask Katrina right away. Like, Hey, do you know if public goods has that too? And she's like, yeah, no, they do. We'll order that. So mouthwash is the next one I have coming. So yeah. I've like, I I've toothpaste my toothpaste and soap. Dude, my, way. my bathroom and cleaning supplies in the entire house, like doesn't matter what it is, is now been replaced all by, and I wish I would have done it sooner because the amount of money that I'm saving is ridiculous. Like the price on like bars of soap and things that you use, toothpaste, that stuff that we use every single day mm -hmm. is significantly lower than all your name brand prices. And I kind of like, I'm like digging the whole black and white theme where it's just very simple and clean. And now it's looking all I, I, you would like that. For oh, sure. I do. Yeah. I like as stupid as that is. Like part of why I even like is I open underneath my kitchen cap or counter and like all the bottles and things I use they all, all match. match. Yeah, yeah it's no, as stupid of course, as that. Yeah. bro. You know, okay. So you know, it's funny. You and Jessica have some very interesting things in common. Uh, She'll buy products now besides public goods because that comes like very uniform. But if she buys a product, she'll take that product in that bottle of whatever it is, and she buys other bottles to pour it in because it looks better. <laughs> so our kitchen has like these, <laughs> these uniform, nice, it's very aesthetic. And I would never have thought this cause I'm not, this is not in my mind. Yeah, yeah. If you come to my house, you can see she's got a really good eye for the stuff, but she does this. She'll like, Oh, these are, these are for olive oil and they're, they're green and they all look the same. And so she'll take the olive oil, fill them all up. And these are for soap. And you know, these are for our dental floss and specific containers that are, you know, all look yeah. really good. And then we were talking about Christmas decorations 
And I remembered something you had said. She's so funny. She's very similar. I'm like, yeah, we could have lots of colors and this and that. She's like, no, there's got to be a theme. It's got to look kind of clean. And like, just like you, dude. Just so like- funny you brought that up. So literally last night, the other thing that I was talking about. So we were exploring the idea. I don't think I'm going to do it because um, it is way more expensive than I actually anticipated. Um, you can actually hire companies to come in and completely do your entire house. Like for holiday cri- decorating. Yeah, yeah, like completely oh. Christmas theme. Out. Bro, price it out. Uh, I, believe I did. You. I already did. That's why I'm probably not going to do it because it's a little more ridiculous than I thought it was going to be. And you don't even get that. You don't even keep it. So you, there's multiple options, right? Oh, so they, it's, they it's put gift. the stuff up and then take it back. Right. So they mm-hmm. have, you You can, the, the bare entry level is um, you basically tell them or show them like through Pinterest or things like, oh, this is the theme that we like. Like we, Katrina wants to do like this black and white theme this year. So you can show them a theme and they come in and they do everything from outdoor, indoor, all of it. And they set, they set it up and then they take it. Or you can go buy all the stuff that you would want and then you just have them set it all up and then they take it down and, and they, they leave it. Um, or you can do like a blend of the two. But the, even the cheapest is like five to $7,000. Oh, and that's, that's not keeping the product, right? So I, was, I told her, I was like, well... Find out what it is because even if it's really expensive, because I anticipated it to be a little expensive, if they if we could go, oh, I want this black and white theme, and they include like let's say it cost me like eight grand to do all of it, but I know that six grand of that is the stuff, and now that they have decorated it one time, and I have exactly what it you looks get to like. Keep it. I could keep it, and then next year maybe I do it myself. I would totally pay for that. I would do that. But it doesn't. It doesn't include. I would stuff. imagine part of the reason why it's so expensive is it's probably like a luxury, you know, service. Totally. Like I can't imagine anybody doing it other than people with a lot of expendable income. Yeah, I mean, remember when we looked at? I don't remember if I. I know Doug and I yeah. talked about this. Like we were going to do the Christmas lights at the Tahoe house, and I thought I was like floored by the price of just putting up Christmas lights in a couple uh-huh. trees. Yeah. It was ridiculous. I think it was going to cost like ten thousand oh dollars to put some to put literally some Christmas what, are they lights. Using Tesla coils, like what's I that? mean, it, the price is like by the they do it by the the size of the tree, right? So if you're doing these little eight foot Christmas trees, not a big deal. But we have you know thirty, forty, fifty foot trees around the house, and so if we wanted to do a couple of those. Yeah, it was like tens of thousands of dollars. I, I think the only time that would be worth and it. And you don't keep the lights. It's like, what? No, I'll that? keep doing the Clark Griswold style. Uh, but and, you, it, uh, you know what it also- I myself on the roof. It also opened up, I and mean, we have this time, right? We this. Whenever I see this, I guess the, this is the uh, you know young kid hustling, trying to find a job. I'm like, oh man, there is an opportunity. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I tell you what, you if I was- definitely undercut that Yes, if I was like a starving break. kid or something yeah. like that. I mean, I mean, li- Pinterest now like lays it out for you. Like, I don't know how much you guys look at Pinterest it's not really like a thing probably we would fortunately more than I'd like to admit. yeah Katrina lives on there loves really? that and it's, I never go on there oh it's a it's for things like well, this shit, it's I gotta a, you know figure out how to decorate all this shit it's dude. amazing I mean it's they've really <laughs> they've really done a good job um of, of scaling that business right and if you have that if you have a tool like that you know how to do that really well it would not be hard to find wealthy people that wanted to do that and pr- you know present what? to them. Not a, a bad business idea for a college kid because right. around the holidays, you probably have some breaks and you're like, this is what I do around the holidays and I make you know, that's a, 30 grand. So exactly and- where your brain is going is how my brain. So when I was a kid, the very first business I ever started when I was 15 years old was A&J Lawn Mowing Service. And the, Wait, hold on. What does A&J stand a- for? Adam and Jason. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> yeah. A&J Lawn Mowing Service. And we had our little business cards made up and our little flyers. And I mean, hey, our mom, our way. moms had to drive us to the locations, right? My mom had a minivan. We'd put the lawnmower on the edger and stuff in the back. But the way we, we literally just, I, I told my mom, take me to the richest neighborhood. So we went to the richest neighborhood and just went door to door and knocked on everybody's door and asked them if they needed it. And I mean, literally within a day of doing that, we had a little clientele that yep. we were servicing every week yep. and putting some money. I, you, I can't imagine if you were to go to a, your richest neighborhood and knock on their doors and say, would you yeah, like your 500 Christ- bucks? I'll put yeah, up your lights. Christmas lights put up or taken down and offer a little bit of a service. I guarantee you would get somebody, Probably. For, for, especially if you make it competitive because there's people like me yeah. who are actively looking yeah, for something. Yeah, you know they're like going to charge three grand. Be like, I'll do it for a thousand. Yeah, yeah you're you going to crush. For sure. Yeah, when I was a kid, one of my first businesses was but I don't also- have insurance. Say what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I won't sue you, I promise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I won't sue. No one of my deal. first businesses was uh, also mowing lawns. So I charged, I don't remember, I think it was $10 to mow a lawn. 
And then once I got the business, I paid my buddy $5 to mow lawns. So I literally <laughs> got the business, kept five bucks and didn't do anything. <laughs> I remember my dad coming home one day and he's like, where's the lawnmower? Oh, I'm, I'm running my business right now. He's like, but why are you watching TV? I'm yeah. like, oh, I, I'm charging 10 bucks. I yeah. make five bucks. And then, and my dad liked it. He thought it was great, but then he wanted, he's like, okay, well, you got to pay me for the gas. Uh, and now the taxes came I'm like, come on, dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop <laughs> teaching me business well, lessons. It's my, lawn, it's my lawnmower. You yeah, got to pay interest yeah. on that. I know. You <laughs> give me some cream over. It was oh, that's well, speaking of business, did you see uh, Luna just signed with a company called uh, Arista, Ararista? How do I say it, Doug? Erosti. Erosti. You were close, off. dude. Erosti. Yeah, it was yeah. not. It was not an easy one. It's like A R R I O S T A or some shit like that. I don't it's like know the but name of the plant. I, brought I just up got the update. I mean, what would I love too? Like, because Luna constantly getting updates on that company. This is another company that we are um, invested in, and maybe I mean, I think we the other day we just talked about the ones that we're most excited about. I think we all agreed that Luna's got so much potential. Luna has yeah. the greatest potential for return, we believe, on on our investment because of the it's in medical and they're just they're and disrupting. Com completely. Yeah. Disrupting. You just gotta rally all the physical Liter therapists literally get them involved. For here. people who are not aware, you can either do the traditional physical therapy where you go to your doctor, primary care refers you a physical therapist, then you go to their clinic, insurance covers it, or you go through Luna, insurance covers it, they come to your house the physical therapist makes more money. The insurance com company saves money and you don't have to go anywhere. And they approve physical therapy for things like, you know, oh, I need to improve my mobility or my shoulder hurts when I bench press. When you go to a doctor, oftentimes they don't refer you. So I can't think how they can lose. It's, it's just can't and lose. And they're just, they keep, um, they keep aligning themselves with these big, big companies that are already, like this company that they're aligning with right now, it looks like they do already have, they're in like 46 different states. They do like a basically digital consulting version, I would say. I mean, if that's how I would probably simplify what it is, like they're, looks like they're offering programs, training, rehab stuff. They do video consultations. Yeah. They assess clients. So, and it's been a successful business model. It's for a nice marriage, I would say. Yeah. And they've been, they've, it looks like this business has been doing well for quite some time. I know they have, they have hundreds of actual employees and probably thousands or tens of thousands of patients they're already servicing. Luna is now pa uh, partnering with them and is now basically offering their service in person. So forever these, this company has done one-on-one -on -one digitally for people and has scaled and had success and now partnering with Luna, they're now going to give they give their clientele the ability to actually have the, the client come in. I, I, I mean, do the, want, uh, I do want to say this because they're growing rapidly and one of the challenges is finding more and more physical therapists, right? Yeah. So if you're listening to this podcast and you're a physical therapist and you either A, want to do at home services, get paid more money, do less paperwork, or you just want to moonlight because you can add this to your current job and make more money, kind of like the way that Uber drivers and other people, you know, in those type of services do it. You go to getluna.com forward slash mind pump and they are actively looking for physical for good physical therapists right now. Yeah. And I think I think they built it knowing that's probably how most people were going to use it as a moon. I mean, that's where the name Luna came from, right? right? Is yeah. that to the whole moonlighting type of deal is that most people will probably have a stable, normal job, and then you will, as a side hustle, pick up some of these patients. Just another you, revenue stream right there. Oh, yeah. You. No, definitely. And then I'm sure there will be exceptions to the rule, just like we see with Uber, right? There's some people that do Uber full-time. I mean, because it can it can be uh, very, very lucrative if, you, if you're on your hustle. I think this is going to be the same way, too. You're going to have a majority of people moonlight. It complements whatever type of career or job they have just for some extra income. And then there'll be some people that see the writing on the wall, like, wow, if I really put my all in on this, I could probably make some really good money yep, doing have it. Have more flexibility, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Yeah. All right, speaking yeah. of medical, did you guys see that OSHA is, they are halting enforcing the vaccine mandates for the time being right now? Did you guys see this? Well, I did see, I saw Florida push yep. back. I heard the interview with Joe Rogan and Shapiro and Shapiro instantly sued uh, them right afterwards. So it sounds like they got enough pushback. Well, that there was a fifth court order that came out and said, halt, we got to look over this because this may not be constitutional. So this was from the court. Yeah, it's not constitutional. And the court said, uh, you can't do this right now. So, so they're not going to enforce it. So moment. do you think this is just was just a political posturing play? I think so. Just to like, I don't look at what we're doing, but then in reality, probably knew. Because you got to think that Biden knew that like, this shit ain't going to fly. Bro, they pushed it like it was an emergency. We need to do this, but we're going to wait till what? January 4th? That's not how... And they pushed it through like it's an emergency. This is an emergency. We got to do... 
but we're going to wait till after the holidays. That makes zero sense. <laughs> it's not an emergency at that point. Yeah, I think Did it you was. See the Lancet study that came out. Which one? The the Lancet one that like basically showed um, that um, you know the transmissible like it was basically like even at the vaccinated community like were just as transmissible as with the uh, the variant the Delta variant. Yeah, so far what the what the data is showing is that it reduces your risk of severe disease, and that's kind of it. Um, otherwise, but you're still passing it on at the same rate. Yeah, yeah. You know, which uh, you know, kind of, and plus you're you're contracting it more often in your home than anywhere yeah, else. Yeah. Well, look, I'll tell found. you. I'll tell you. What, here's my big problem. I don't care where you stand on this uh, on this issue. Um, by the way, I'm not anti-vaccine. I, I I'm pro. Neither am I. I'm just I'm I'm still following current science. Yeah. Okay. But, so this is a current study. Well, that came here's out. my big issue. Okay. If they're if they push mandates and the the reasoning behind it is. We got to save lives, save people. This is better for everybody. And people with vaccine, the vaccine, lower chance of severe illness and death. And it doesn't, you know, bog down that medical system. And they make that argument. Okay, I can see that argument. Then why are we not counting natural immunity? Why do these mandates ignore natural immunity, which all studies show right. that natural immunity is at least as good, if not better, in some studies, compared to the vaccine? That smells like cronyism that smells like big pharma said no let's just mandate the vaccine and not count well, what natural are, immunity what it doesn't we, make any sense what are we seeing um because i don't I've, I've really haven't been following a lot of this stuff anymore i'm so over all this bullshit but i know it's what fucking everyone's talking about because it's uh, uh, unfortunately uh, i have to every yeah i know so just I to get, make sure i'm on top of it when i have conversations right. with people i mean too like in the cdc have you did you see that what they um put out there like it, okay so uh, if you could pull this up doug i'm, I'm going to shoot it over to you but go ahead and talk while i do no that. i was just i was just going to say that um i don't even know like what's what, really i'm not up to date on the stats or what's happening or not um as far as the, is the curve flattening or are we slowing down with stuff also i do know that california and florida took two dramatically different approaches yeah. to this um, and of course, if you listen to CNN, you hear one report on that. If you listen to Fox, you hear the other report on that. So what have you guys like really dove into that? Yep. Like what, how, how is California compared to Florida? So what are they, we seeing? They've done the, uh, the non-Fox CNN version. Yeah. yeah. So they've done big, they've <laughs> yeah. done big studies in all the States and the, the, the beauty of the way that our government, part of the beauty of the way our government's organized, we have States which have certain powers that the federal gov government doesn't have. And this is great because you can have different philosophies in different states, and you can see which one works better. And ultimately, at the end of the day, the states that gain more people and the ones that lose more people could give you a clue as to which ones are you know people like more and which one people don't like. But they did do big studies on this, and here's what they found. Mask mandates and vaccine mandates, or more strict uh, mandates with vaccines, versus states where they have looser mask mandates, looser lockdowns, or, or lockdowns that were ended earlier, and don't have as much of these vaccine mandates. They've compared all these states, and here's what they found. Almost no difference, if not the same. Now, here's where people argue. People argue and say, for example, well, masks work. Uh, studies will show that when you put on a mask and they examine how many you know, droplets come out of your face when you sneeze or cough or talk, it's less, and they'll say, oh, lockdowns, of course those will work because if you're around less people, then you're less likely to, to transmit the virus, which is true. But here's the problem. This is what we see in the fitness industry, by the way. The fitness industry will often take a study and ignore human behavior, right? So the mm -hmm. fitness industry will say, well, artificial sweeteners are great. It cuts your calories. Then you look at real studies in everyday life and people who replace sugary drinks with artificial sweeteners, they don't lose any weight. How could this possibly be? Oh, we're not considering human behavior. They replace it with other calories. So here's what happens. First off, for, max, for, for masks to be effective, they have to be used a particular way. Yeah. So when you have a bunch of kids using masks and they're touching their face and they're reusing them, and most adults do this, by the way, on, off, touch, this, that. Yeah, or the same mask you've been using for three months yeah, that's you never wadded wash it. up in your yeah, fucking yeah, you, glove box. You, <laughs> that, that, that effect is gone. So when you look that at studies- people have used. <laughs> when they look at studies of masks that are controlled, they're using them perfectly. And by the way, if you're in the medical field, you know this, you're trained on how to use a mask. Yeah. And there's a very specific way to use one. 
most people don't do it Court, that way. That was Courtney's argument to me the whole time being a nurse, like the N95. Like you have to go through a whole process of like how to specifically put it on so it's like airtight seal. And then also you do smell tests, you know, alongside that to see if it's actually, you put it on correctly. Yes. And then also taking it off correctly is a whole nother process. None of this information has been passed along to the general public, by the way. No, so you, we're negating human behavior. And then with lockdowns, Okay, is people not being around a lot of people or people isolating, does that prevent the spread of disease? It does, but we're, again, we're, we're negating human behavior. What happens in the states with less lockdown rules is that when they see cases go up, people naturally avoid crowded areas, mm -hmm. naturally don't go to restaurants, don't go to ball games. Right. You start to see these behaviors. So we're completely ignoring human behavior. We're just passing these laws and these rules and not considering With how people, force. Yeah. how they actually act, which is why when they do these big studies, doesn't matter. We're not yeah. seeing a difference because of those things. Well, yeah. So just back, circle back to the CDC thing. So the CDC admits no unvaccinated person has ever contracted COVID, i.e. developed natural immunity, recontracted COVID, and therefore transmitted it to another person. Yeah. Well, they have, yeah, they have no case. That doesn't mean it hasn't happened, but they have not, they don't have an example. Well, but wait, so they, again, so, they, so someone like me who's had COVID already, right. they're saying that uh, there's not a, a situation where someone like me has caught it again and given it to somebody else? That's, that what, what, that's what they're yes. saying, that they don't oh, have wow. any cases. Yes, which is, that's a big deal. Yeah, and again, yeah, no, really again, if you think, if you think big, there's an issue with big pharma influencing government and you're like, oh my yeah. God, you know. It shows you the power of natural immunity. Dude, but, okay, the, here's a big clue. If they're telling you that they're, if they're, if they're mandating vaccines to save people's lives and, and they're following the science, they would include natural immunity. What they would say is, yes. they would say you have to either be vaccinated or show that you have antibodies because those are, they're, they're all, they're both protective, right? Right. But they don't count natural immunity, which to me smells like, Bullshit. It smells mm -hmm. like we're just trying to get, it, it may, yes, there's benefit. Well, there's only one hammer to fix all of these uh, issues and treatments. Like there's no real treatment. It's just like, this is just the thing. Yeah. By the it. way, other countries count natural immunity. There are other countries where you have to have a vaccine, but you also can show that you've had COVID and you have natural immunity and they'll count that. For some reason in this country, that doesn't count. So you could have all the natural immunity in the world. Sorry. You're just- Are we the only ones that are doing that? No, lots of countries are doing that, but there are some that count natural immunity along with uh, with vaccination. Do you know who does? I can't. I, off the top of my head, I can't remember. But I do remember reading an article that showed. Well, that definitely should be part of the conversation. Was it Israel? Since Israel was the one that came out with all the studies that, uh, like, kind of. That's a good question. I don't know. We would hope so yeah, if they were the ones that were the first to kind of come out and, yeah. and, and prove that. It's a very good question. But again, you got to count human behavior, and just because you pass a law doesn't mean it's going to do the in, the intention of that law. And people do, for the most part, behave in particular ways. And in these places where there were no lockdowns, when cases went up, people just didn't go out as much. They didn't need to be told yeah. to, to isolate themselves. Now, what's your guys' prediction on what, we, what we're going to see over the course of the next year or two with this? Are we going to be wearing masks, you think, two years from now? Like, is that still going to be going on? What do you think is going to happen? I think mm -hmm. we're already seeing a huge divide between the blue states and the red states. Mm -hmm. So if you talk, I have friends that that lived in California. Both sides will just double, triple down. Yeah, and now they live in Florida or Texas and they, they're like, bro, they're like, it's almost as if COVID's gone. It's not a discussion. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares. Nobody's wearing masks. It feels very different. And then now we're in California, a very blue state, and very much feels like COVID is around. Everywhere I go, there's masks and watch out and be careful. And there's lots of these conversations. Double mask, mask in the car by yeah, yourself. So I think you're going to see, you're going to continue to see that kind of divide where like some states are more, I guess, precautious and fearful. Other states, maybe not so much. Um, but a year is short. I think in three or four years, we're going to, we're going to start to see that this, we're not going to see these spikes of, of cases. It's, it's becoming endemic. You're either vaccinated or you have natural immunity. And we're going to stop seeing this huge impacts on, you know. On we're also right in the middle of winter time. We're starting a winter time right now. So I yeah, imagine this is now cold to, season to January, in February, we'll probably see the worst. Yeah. And then hopefully by next summer, we start to see it improve. Yep. Hey, real quick. I hope you're enjoying this episode. You need to check out Pathwater. Now, I know you drink water. You listen to this podcast. You're also human. Water is good for you. The problem is plastic bottles pollute the earth. They end up in the ocean. They don't recycle very well. Well, Pathwater is in aluminum bottles that are also reusable. In other words, you buy Pathwater, it doesn't cost you any more money 
than a normal bottle of water of equivalent size. It's fully recyclable, or you could take that bottle, wash it out, and reuse it. So it's good for the environment, and it's good for you. By the way, did you know plastic can sometimes leach chemicals into your water? It's true. Go with the aluminum bottles from Pathwater. Go check them out. Head over to drinkpath.com and use the code MINDPUMP for 10% off your entire purchase. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Emmy from Maine. Hey, Emmy, how can we help you? Hey, yeah, thanks for taking my call. Um, so first, I want to say thank you for all your great content. I'm actually um, board certified in emergency medicine and obesity medicine, and I've shared your content with fellow physicians and patients. So awesome. I just oh, wow. want to say awesome. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my question is this. So I'm a recovering marathon addict, um, stopped running a couple of years ago in the setting of osteopenia and other health problems. Started lifting. I started with MAPS Anabolic and a personal trainer to help me get my form down. Didn't like it, but stuck with it. And now I'm really, really into it. So I tried, I started MAPS Aesthetic a couple, probably a couple months ago. And I my focus areas were glutes and back. And what I found was about three weeks in, I was just in constant, I was constantly sore, like more so than would be expected because the foundational movements involved posterior chain, but then I was also doing my focus areas posterior chain. So that meant I was lifting for my posterior chain, my back, my glutes almost daily. Um, full disclosure, I'm type A, so I probably do everything too much. Um, so I was <laughs> just wondering <laughs> how I could, so I stopped, it's been a couple of weeks. I'm doing body weight, getting massages. I'm feeling better and I'm ready to start again, but just wondering how I do that without getting too sore. Yeah. Good question. I mean, okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, you work with patients, you work with, uh, obesity patients as well. Yep. Um, so let's, let's change the, the conversation a little bit. Let's pretend that you're one of your patients. So yep. type A person comes to you, they were addicted to exercise or a form of exercise before, and they're coming to you with these types of complaints. Listen, I'm sore all the time. I'm tight. Um, I'm not feeling very good. What would your advice be to this patient that you really want to make sure, you know, does the right thing? I mean, of course I would say you probably need to cut back. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, now would you probably say that or is that pro- is that like what you would say? <laughs> A trick question. Um, yeah. I would most likely say do some more rest and recovery days, stretching, yeah. yoga, walks, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, yeah. but I really like I like to exercise. It is my stress relief from a crazy job. Um, so that that's hard for me to swallow. And I feel like there's got to be some way to do this program to have your <laughs> there's gotta be a, there's gotta be a middle ground, right? A middle ground yeah. somewhere there. What so yeah. I would I would actually want to know a little more detail about. Uh, your exercise selection on focus days. So may, uh, maybe you are doing some things on focus days that are a little more taxing than uh, I would want. And then maybe I could just adjust some of those exercises so you don't feel so sore. Yeah. I mean, I definitely like my favorite, I'm really tall. I'm 5'10". My favorite kind of way to feel my glutes is like a sumo deadlift. Oh, yeah. Um, so that's probably a little much. Oh yeah, that yeah. should that should not that should <laughs> that, yeah that absolutely should not be on your focus days. So here's and so that that's what I thought. Okay, so even though you're type A and the the overdoing it thing, like Sal said, I mean that's definitely uh, you're overdoing the the exercise selection. If you were doing fire hydrants and glute kickbacks and hamstring curls on the machines and doing some or hip bridges. hip bridges on the floor, single yep. leg, that type of stuff, I bet you would not be as taxed. You are choosing a uh, one of the most uh, taxing compound lifts that you could do on your body on what we have designed as focus days. And focus days are completely different than foundational days. And that's where that stuff belongs. Mm-hmm. So foundational days were built for compound lifts, things that tax the CNS on your focus days. You should be doing the things that are single much joint easier. movements. Yes, yeah, single yeah, joint yeah. movements, pumping type exercises, and I bet if you just adjusted that and got rid of the uh, you know compound type lifts and treated the focus days like you're just kind of touching and getting yeah. the pump. You're just mm-hmm. trying to get a pump. Work on maybe some of the the mobility, flexibility, stretching stuff, which you already alluded to that you think that that you would recommend. 
and get away from doing the stuff that's really, really yeah, hitting. Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, you can you can stay busy. Uh, I know that's that's a big part of it. Is you can stay yeah. plenty busy doing those exercises. You just got to bring that intensity level down and pick the right, right types of exercises in between to, you know, be able to recover properly. So that way, you know, your progress is going to keep moving forward. But yeah. yeah, this is where machines come in. Body weight bands. I mean, stay in that think, sort yeah. of. Yeah, is it mindset. like um. A- like the band days, like the um, trigger sessions in MAPS Anabolic, yeah. is yeah. it like it's kind cl- of yes, more it's intense than that, but not maybe a like little a bit, it, you know, a little bit more intense. In your in your case, I wouldn't go too intense. I, look, okay, you're an emergency room physician. I've trained mm-hmm. a lot of ememergency room physicians. I'm going to make a guess here that your sleep probably isn't the greatest. Yep, horrible. Yeah, so yeah. so y- your body is very taxed. Um, now I know you like the daily activity or to do something. Um, yeah. and admittedly you've been addicted to marathons, which kind of give you that, that push and that, you know, like that mm-hmm. grinding feel. I'm going to say, you know what, your best options on focus days may not even be resistance training at all. It may be yoga. I know you don't want to hear that, but if you were my client, that's what I would make you do. I'd make you do two or three foundational workouts a week max. And then I'd have you do some kind of mindfulness, uh, recuperative movement on the other days. I would not focus on causing any additional damage to the body, because you're, what you're doing is you're running yourself into the ground. You mentioned that you had some osteopenia issues. Yep. Okay, that is that, can, and you were active, right? You were active, uh, and you oh, still. Oh, I was running marathons. I actually, it's all resolved now that I've been strength training on a DEXA, by the way. Yeah, so resistance training Beautiful. is great for that. Now, here's the deal, though: if you push resistance training too often and too hard, <laughs> you become marathon running. You'll run, you'll, you'll run into <laughs> similar problems. Yes. So you're you're starting your body's breaking down. And you have to, this is a very mental thing. Uh, The best advice I could give you is to train yourself like you were training one of your patients. I've had to do this to myself time and time again. I've said this so many times on the show that trainers, coaches, doctors, especially. We're the worst clients. We're the worst patients for ourselves. We're so much better with other people than we are with ourselves. So my, I mean, if you were my client, I mean, what I would do is I would have you do two foundational workouts a week. I wouldn't even have you do three. And then all the other days I would do something recuperative, uh, whether it be a yin yoga, walking, mobility, stretching, you know, maybe light focus session type work, but really work with your body. Otherwise you're going to hit a wall um, and be in a similar situation to where you were before. And the more you hit that wall, the more often you hit that wall, the harder it is to pull back. You can cause some, some issues that might take a while to recover from to where the body's so fried, you have to take uh, all exercise off completely to let your body kind of get back to, you know, a, a place of of health. So, you know, go into this really slow and then kind of trust the process. And it's going to be a mental, this is going to be a big yeah. mental challenge. So just kind of refocus your, your energy. You know, I, I you know, I, I can relate to you. So oftentimes what I'll do is I'll change my focus because I, sometimes I need to change my goal, right? So for example, if I'm trying to get leaner, it, it can mess with my head that I'm dieting and I'm weaker in the gym. So then what I'll do is I'll change my workouts so that they're faster paced or superset. So I have to go lighter anyway. So it kind of it helps that situation, right? So maybe change the focus and say, okay, I'm going to try and get stronger with two foundational workouts a week. And then on the other days, you know what my goal is? My goal is to improve mobility in these areas that I lack mobility or improve connection or you know what? I'm, to- I'm sore and I'm tight and I'm stiff. My goal is to see if I can make myself feel much better by the end of this mobility session. And you just kind of change that focus. So you're still goal oriented. It's just not the, you know, the, the hardcore, you know, build strength or endurance or stamina type goals, if that makes any sense. I don't, I don't yeah, complete, I don't completely disagree with Sal's advice at all. Although I'd probably compromise a little more with you just because the training type A people is definitely uh, what I trained more of than anything else and trying to take somebody who was training five to seven days a week and like you are, and then say, okay, I'm going to cut you all the way down to two and then do yoga is like so opposite of what you probably <laughs> like and want. Um, I also would be concerned about you sticking with that. And so I would probably take more of a weaning off approach with you where I'd say, listen, I'm not going to tell you to completely change everything you're doing. I would just want you to say, let's get rid of the compound lifts and the really taxing exercises on the focus days and really do more recuperative trigger session type of stuff. So like Justin said, bands, body weight stuff, and really start to reduce there. 
And that doesn't mean I disagree with what Sal's saying, though. I, I, my personal goal as a trainer would be to get you to where he's at. I would be afraid to tell you to go there right away in, in fear of that you won't listen right. to me and follow it to a yeah. T. Well, you, you know yourself. Okay, so yeah. you're, you're going to have to. Okay, so you don't have to answer here now. But if you feel like you'll slip into old patterns by compromising, then I think you should rip the Band-Aid off and go full on to what I said. If you feel like doing what I said is going to discourage you so much that it's going to make you go in the opposite direction, then I'd say go in the direction that Adam is saying. Now, you know, I know myself. I know that compromising, it, it, there's, no comprom there's no compromising for me. It's all or nothing. And I tend to slip back into old patterns. But you know yourself better than obviously we do. So you're going to have yeah, to step I outside mean, of yourself and make that, make that right decision. But I think you know the answer. I, I think you really yeah. know what the right answer is. You just have to convince yourself to follow through. I mean, I definitely don't want to get when I was running marathons, getting to the point where to get my health back, I had to not exercise for four months. That was like the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Right. Yeah, yeah, no, I feel you. You know what? I you, don't want to be there. So have, I'm I'm willing to do cut back if I don't have to ever do that again. Emmy, do you have access to Maps, Maps Prime Pro? I have Prime Pro. Yep. Okay. If you decide to go in the direction that I said on those other yep. days, why not pick mobility movements in Prime Pro? and focus on those on those days. And you can spend yep. 30 minutes doing different mobility movements. You can't movements. do those movements too much. Yeah, That's the beauty of really it. hard to overtrain with those. And they will, yep. they should help with your recovery. And then of course, I know sleep is an issue. Um, yep. I'm sure I'm, I'm preaching the choir here, but you know, make sure you 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 prioritize sleep when you can because I think that's yep. that's a very very big factor with the the type of job that you have. And since it's posterior yep. chain stuff that you're feeling where you're fried, really put a lot of emphasis on the hips and the ankles and some shoulder stuff like that. Do those do those the most at a Prime Pro? I think that you'll get the most bang for your buck for uh, what you're dealing yeah, with. Yeah, good advice. Okay, that was really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no problem, Emmy. Thank you. Hey, good luck. Okay, you know, are you Thanks. in our forum? No, no. Okay, let me, I'm going to let you in our forum. I would love to get some, just some follow through. Like, let us know how you're doing. There's yeah. other coaches in there. We have other doctors in there. You're a great story yeah. for there too. People need to hear you talk more. Totally. You know, yeah. you, obviously people are going to respect I, what you say because of your I, position too, so. Well, and I think, um, you know, it's, really um some of your episodes like that focus on that talk about the weight loss there was one episode a long time ago on the no cardio something about weight loss and not doing cardio and like i said i've shared that with some medical directors of obesity clinics and um it's it's really really helpful because the way that you um explain things gives physicians the language to talk about with patients because sometimes it's hard to find that. So oh, that's the one, that. that's one of the best. Uh, yeah, that's one of the best compliments I think we could ever have. That's our goal. So thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate that feedback. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Emmy. Thank you. Thank you. Boy, uh, I tell you what, is there any truer statement than trainers, coaches, doctors are way better <laughs> with their patients than they are with themselves? Oh, yeah. I mean, I love this. This is uh, this was a, a, the bulk of my clientele right here was, you know, type A, yep, uh, middle age, go getters, yep. CEOs, VPs, doctors, nurses like that love to get after it. You got to pull them back all the time. Yeah. Right? And that's the only reason why uh, I challenged your advice because I know that it, depending on the personality, uh, some they hear that and it goes in one year out there. They're like, "Fuck that!" Yeah. Like this guy's gonna take me from five days a week, and he's telling me two, and then take. No. You know, you know, you know what's funny is <laughs> it's I, really and, hard to reach. And him. you know, no, you make a very good point. The reason why I went the direction I did is because of her history. Well, because it's the right answer. Well, not yeah. just. I mean, you give the you're giving the right advice. Well, it's not just that. It's that she had osteopenia as yeah. a result of overtraining. That means right. your body is literally breaking down. Yeah. yeah. Um, she's a emerge. Look, I've trained emergency room physicians. They are adrenaline addicts. Yeah, like yeah. that's no. their favorite thing she's, to do. Yeah, she's a cortisol junkie for sure. My yeah. ex was an ER nurse, and that and they absolutely are that way. They 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 love that rush. And your advice is right. I was what I was not challenging was not the advice. The advice you gave, hundred percent, where she needs to go. I'm just like I'm a little more about ripping the. I'm more right. slow pull the bandaid yeah, yeah. off than rip it off. But you're right. It really depends on the personality because some people will just. You know, they'll kind of do that, but then yeah. they'll go slip well, back. You're actually like that. I've seen you change your goal and you don't slowly do it. No, you're you right. You change it completely. Have, yeah. And, right. I, and it, that helps me too, because if I do the slow thing, it's like I end up, <laughs> I end up doing what I wanted to do anyway. Yeah, type yeah, of deal, no, yeah, you're right. Our next caller is Hannah from California. What's up, Hannah? How can we help you? 
Hi. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you guys. Thank you for everything. You guys have changed my life and changed many others' lives, and you guys have made me a better trainer. So thank you guys so much for oh, everything. You're welcome. That you're- um, so my question is just regarding powerlifting and the longevity of it. I've been doing powerlifting for about four years now since I was 18, just as a hobby. And now I have decided I want to take it to a more competitive level. I want to compete at IPF Worlds one day. You know, I really want to take this far. But um, an issue I keep running into is trying to figure out how to take care of myself. You know, I've been going to the doctor about certain things and little issues I'm having. And he tells me the best thing is to quit powerlifting Mm -hmm. and that it's just hard on the body. So um, I've also heard like you guys talk about powerlifting training, how you guys love powerlifting training, but one rep maxes are just not you know, the best for your body. Um, but that's a lot of my training. And so my question is, how do I make sure I'm taking care of myself, you know, for the long run, but also pursuing this dream I have of becoming, you know, a really good competitive high level power lifter. Are you, are you currently following our power lift program? I'm not. Are you following a program or are you just doing your own thing? Yes. I'm, well, I was following a program right now. I took a little bit of a break and I'm about to start a new program next month. Okay. Because I would think that, I mean, hopefully if it's a, a, a good program that you actually shouldn't be doing one rep maxes much at all. In fact, the, a good program should set it up to where you peak at your meet and you that's where you do your one rep max. Most of your training should be at a much lower intensity. Is it designed that way? Do you know? Yes. Yes, it is. But just getting close to the meet, even like the last two weeks of yeah. doing you know, one rep or even on competition day, Got that it. adrenaline comes over you and Got sometimes it. your body you know, really far. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, studies on injuries related to sport. So there's, there's two pieces of advice I'm going to give you in and, and one comment. Uh, the comment is uh, the typical doctor's advice for anything is to stop doing it. That's not always the best, <laughs> not always the best <laughs> advice. Go to button. I mean, you won't hurt anymore. That's for sure. But then you won't power lift anymore. And then, you know, obviously you're going to miss out on, on a big part of quality of life. All right. So here's a pieces of advice that I have for you. So one studies show that one of the just one of the best ways to avoid aches, pains, and injuries for any athlete, this is general advice now, is to cross train. So what mm-hmm. they find is, for example, that runners who cut out some running and do some cycling, for example, typically don't lose stamina and endurance, but they do reduce their aches and pains. This is true for resistance training as well. So generally speaking, depending on how far out you are from a particular meet, I would recommend doing cycles of bodybuilding style training or, you know, more athletic type uh, movement. I was going to go in the same direction, but I was going in more of the performance of like, you know, because it's so, uh, you know, one plane, one dimensional, uh, I would definitely like go through a cycle of just trying to get through like, you know, lateral, uh, you know, frontal plane, like more, more planes of motion, uh, to, to reinforce and strength. Yeah. If you look at your season, um, obviously when you're training for a meet, that's powerlifting training, right? But the time before that, when you're, let's say off season, then you could do, like I said, bodybuilding or like a maps performance types type of workout. And then more specifically, mobility work is going to be extremely beneficial. I, 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 mobility work benefits everyone, but boy, does it really benefit powerlifters because powerlifters are constantly pressing their body uh, or, or, or hammering the seams, if you will, because it's the same movements over and over, constantly getting stronger. And if there's a little bit of a deviation in form or technique or a little bit of a mobility issue, the average person might not notice it, but because you're constantly pushing the same exercises, your squat, your deadlift, and your bench press, those can become big issues. Mobility work makes a big difference. So like right now, when you're in, if you're in season, I would definitely do some mobility work every single day, maybe mm-hmm. two or three times a day, 10, 15 minutes, twice a day. That should help a lot. But in the off season, you got to cross train. Don't just power lift all the time. Yeah, I would add to that too. Mobility, unilateral training is going to highlight a lot of those, uh, you know, imbalances and things that, you know, instabilities that may be, you know, under the surface that you might not necessarily pick up on because everything's so bilateral and everything you can do kind of like is is controlled that way. Uh, so to add a little more instability by doing unilateral training will kind of show you uh, maybe some areas of improvement that you can reinforce, and then you're going to feel the difference of that going back 
back into uh, powerlifting. We could also probably get a little more specific on what mobility drills. If we know what what uh, what are the injuries or what is the doctor? What are you going to the doctor for? Or is it is it hip stuff? Is it ankle? Is it knee, shoulder? What do you got going on? I have, I believe it's a compressed nerve. We didn't find out. Um, the doctor pretty much told me he had no idea, but a lot of tingling um, throughout my body, mostly in my upper back. So because there wasn't really any answer he could give me, he said the best thing is to just stop. Yeah, that that sounds like it's coming from the kind of cervical part of the spine. Um, it's, so you're feeling it down your arm and in the upper body? I'm feeling in my upper back and then on my legs. Oh, oh, and then oh. down to the legs. Okay. I don't know. So hips and shoulder, hips, yeah. and, hips, hips and shoulder mobility is where like the guys were just recommending every, you know, two, three times a day for 10, 15 minutes. Um, I would love to see you do. So if you don't have prime pro, we need to get you prime pro, uh, you take prime pro and focus on hip stuff and shoulder stuff and do that two or three times a day, every day. Uh, and in addition to some of the advice the guys are already given, I think that you will see a world of a difference from that alone. Yeah. Hannah, when's your competition? I actually had one this weekend. I had to drop out because of my back. So okay. I'm planning to go to nationals in May next of next year. Oh, okay. I'm so glad you did that. Okay. Yeah. So I had no idea that it was a nerve issue. This is something we want to treat a little bit more carefully because when you're talking about a little bit of ankle, you know, pain or joint pain, mobility work and, you know, stretching and that kind of stuff can help. Nerve stuff you don't want to mess with because you could, you could go from tingling to like, oh my God, big time weakness on one side of my body or a lot of pain that takes months to heal. Since we're since we have till May, which gives us a lot of time, I definitely think you should switch your training away from powerlifting. This is your off season right now. I think it would be smart to go really easy and light for a couple weeks, two or three weeks, and then move into something like Maps Performance. Watch the intensity and focus on perfect technique and form. That's that's where I think you should go right now. Now, after you're done with Maps Performance, if everything feels good. You're feeling strong, then you can jump back into some kind of powerlifting training. If you don't have MAPS performance, we'll send that over to you, okay? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. No problem, mm -hmm. Hannah. Thanks for calling. Thank you. You know, th this makes me want to communicate this particular point. In fact, I was on a podcast yesterday, and this was one of the topics of discussion, which is we often look at maximum performance as the as healthy, right? Mm -hmm. But the truth is, if you're pushing your body to any limit, you are sacrificing longevity and health for performance. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. I mean, I do that. There's a quality of life thing that you need to factor in. But if you're trying to be the strongest or the biggest or the rippedest or have the most stamina. Or the fastest. Or the fat, you are yeah. going to be sacrificing longevity yeah. well, and health for it's that. It's good to stretch your abilities and your capacity in that direction. And so, you know, to pursue that is, you know, that's a valid goal. But yeah, you got to realize that uh, everything else sort of, um, you know, gets sacrificed along the way, but you got to come back and reinforce it and, and build out the whole again. So you got to consider, you know, moving in another direction to then benefit everything else. Well, we, we, we worship, uh, athletes so much. Yeah. Uh, and we, we assume that because they look amazing, they do these great feats that they're extremely healthy and it's not true at all. Some of the most banged up, beat up <laughs> clients I ever got were people that were athletes most of their life. So their body fat percentage is low because they're so goddamn active. Um, but really that repetitiveness of the same, the same thing, and same just pushing the limits, yeah, same yeah. movements, pushing the limits, going as hard, as fast and as long as you can all the time, uh, sport, sport is not technically healthy for you. And does that mean, can you intermittently play sports and it, and it actually benefit your life and you be a healthier person? That's yes. And I'm not saying that sports is bad, but we have this misconception that all athletes are really healthy because they have a low body fat percentage or yeah. something. You know, you know it's Meanwhile, funny. they're redlining the whole time. Yeah, That's totally. It. In fact, if you took the top three professional sports and you averaged out the lifespans, I would bet that they have a shorter lifespan than the average uh, American. Mm -hmm. And that's mainly because of football. But even if you took football out, looked at the average lifespan of a professional basketball player and baseball player, at most, they probably match the average American because they offset their active, they're fit, 
they burn calories, but then what offsets that is just pushing well, your body yeah, all let, the time. Let's look at the the top tier athletes now and what they've figured out. Like you got your Tom Brady, you know, you got LeBron, LeBron James. LeBron James. Yeah. Like what are they like hyper focused on? Spending a million dollars on recovery. Millions of dollars on yeah. recovery yep. and, and figuring all that out so they have that kind of uh, longevity in their peak performance. Well, and even if Sal's point about uh, longevity isn't true, uh, for sure, uh, the chronic pain you are going to see. Yeah. So like maybe they don't die soon because football does. I know the life expectancy of a football player is really low. Um, and maybe there's not much of a correlation to like how long they live, but the quality of their life, you find an athlete who's played sports for 30 years and you're talking about back pain, shoulder pain, knee pain, hip pain. They, Dude, I mean, this this hit me. For this hit me like a ton of bricks. I was in my early 20s and I didn't really understand this fully. And I went to this big fitness convention and when I was a young kid, I was a big pro wrestling fan. So like the Iron Sheik and Mr. Perfect and all that stuff. Anyway, they were there at the convention signing autographs. And by this point, these guys are in their 50s and 60s, right? They were, they were, they looked like terrible health. They had poor, I mean, they would get, some of them had, had canes and walkers, could barely move. And I remember looking at my heroes who used to jump off the top rope and do backflips and be like, oh my God, this guy's, in his 60s and he can barely move. And then it dawned on me, like, of course, those yeah. guys were doing crazy crap to their bodies. You can't run like that for too long without suffering the consequences. And that's when I realized, like, okay, it's yeah, great to push your body to limits. There's some fun to that, but you are sacrificing longevity. Oh, yeah. that, what was that? The, was it that movie, The Wrestler? Mickey oh, yeah. Rourke? Mickey Rourke? Yeah. Oh, that highlighted it perfectly. No, it did a good job of highlighting yeah. what you're talking about. Our next caller is Nicole from California. Nicole, welcome back. How's it been? What's Hi. going on? Glad to be back. Yeah. So what? So what's happening? How can we help you? Oh, not much. I was just coming on to give you guys a follow up. Um, so it's probably been close to ten weeks since I was on last. Um, in regards to my whole story with the spinal meningitis and having the one leg shorter than the other and everything. So I followed you guys' advice on doing a lot of just uni uh, unilateral stuff. Um, you know, a lot of single leg work. Um, you had mentioned doing like 15 minutes a day, every day. Um, I increased uh, creatine. I was sure taking like the half scoops um, daily. Um, and I can't believe how, what a difference. It just, it's awesome. I mean, my legs have grown so much. I can do things like with my leg that I couldn't do yoga poses I can do now. Um, I kick myself in the ass for not doing single leg work 10, 15 years ago. Um, so it's been great. Amazing. I mean, I can't even thank you guys enough on how awesome it's been. Nicole, I'm, I'm getting the chills right now. So I remember you, you awesome. told us, you know, your, your story about, you know, what happened as a kid and you always had this kind of deficiency on one side. And, you know, our advice was unilateral work. And we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, how to kind of change the mentality around those things. I'm so glad you called us to give an update. In fact, uh, I thought about you a few times afterwards. I remember the story you told us. I was like, man, that's really challenging. So you're noticing a big improvement. You feel like it's big. It's made a good difference then. Yeah. You know, um, I have a couple of questions to just uh, to kind of follow up. But in regards to that, yeah, I mean, I can't believe how much my actual, my right leg, my good leg grew in, in like, I was like, oh, okay, great. I had to suck it up. I won't lie. I didn't take your advice for a little bit. I was doing like, <laughs> it was, you know, it, I had to like get out of my own way. Um, and I just seen a drastic improvement even on my good leg, which was crazy to um, see. So it's overall been great. Um, so I'm like looking at my notes. So I just have a couple follow-up questions that okay. I'd like to ask. Um, so in regards to just watching my legs build, um, I, kind of remove myself from the scale, but I have noticed an overall, um, and I know you guys talked about this before, an overall like thickness, like everywhere in my body that I didn't really notice before. So I'm just kind of wondering if that is kind of normal. It's nothing that I'm ashamed of, but I'm, you know, it's like, I just kind of want to know if that's normal. Yeah. So, okay. Do you feel stronger? Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and, and you're yeah. noticing more muscle in those target areas, the the legs, both the the target one and then the one that was okay. Yep, yep. Yeah, you're gaining muscle, 
and you, and you feel good because you're gaining some muscle. Now, did you gain body fat? I don't know. Um, you know, maybe, probably not. I think what you did is you started to send the right signal to your body. You upped your creatine. Creatine is a very effective natural supplement for building muscle and helping with recovery. It's also got some health, some good health properties. You probably built a lot of muscle. One of the ways you can tell, by the way, if it's mostly muscle versus body fat is performance in the gym. Strength increase. Strength, yeah, strength. Where do you notice the, the, the tighter feelings? Is it in the parts where there's muscle or do you feel it around your waist where we tend to store body fat, it, right? It's your waist. And, you know, I, I understand I'm a female and, you know, I had brought it up previously that I cut my creatine big time just because I did feel bloated, but I have over, you know, the weeks, like, uh, been very consistent with the creatine and I've noticed a big change and I think that's a big helper. So I don't know if that's it, but yeah, it's around my waist. And I think to that point, um, I started to notice within like three weeks in that I was like starving, like yeah. literally yeah. starving. This is like, all good. Those are good and, signs. This is all very good signs. And, and so I've been trying to get up to like hundred to 120 grams of protein a day. So I've really been packing my mornings with protein because I just felt like in the afternoon, I was like just eating. I, I work from home and my pantry's right behind me at my desk and it's a nightmare. So. <laughs> yeah. so here's, so, so welcome to the other mind game now. Okay. So <laughs> there was some mind game, there was some mind game challenges we had going into this and now we're encountering some other ones. And this is a common one for, especially for women is the building muscle aspect, right. getting stronger aspect, it can start to mess with you a little bit. But if we took that out, let's just just take that part out for a second. Let's just pretend that you didn't even notice any of that. Everything else feels great, right? Uh, even the increase in appetite mm. probably feels good. You're stronger. Energy might be better. Is your libido feeling better? How's your sleep? Like, look at all those signs. And if those things are better... Um, then I wouldn't worry about the feeling bigger part. And that, again, that can really mess with people's heads. Now, if, if your diet is comprised of a lot of heavily processed foods, you may in fact be eating way too much. But if you know you're eating whole natural foods, you're focusing on your protein, you're noticing performance you know, gains in the gym or with your workouts and your legs feel better, I wouldn't worry about that right now at all. I, I think you're going in the right direction. Well, I, I, yeah, I think you're you're killing it. We still we do have the option though. You could run a mini cut. I mean, if you if the if you felt the metabolism kick back up, you've been hitting your protein targets. We've built some good muscle. You've you've kicked ass for what a couple months now. Um, and you if you wanted to lean out a little bit, there, I don't think there's anything wrong either with running a little bit lower calorie for a couple weeks and then coming back. Um, to your maintenance or surplus too. So you know, our focus was a little bit different last time, right? We were the the biggest focus was the imbalance and really helping you there. I think that was the main conversation that we talked about. But it looks like you've had uh, tremendous success with that, and now you're noticing some things like that uh, around your waist. And there's nothing wrong with us saying, "Hey, let's let's run two weeks of a, a lower calorie diet for a while and see if that leans you out a little bit and see how you feel." Uh, and then go back to your maintenance or surplus. Uh, so long as you're in a, a healthy place calorie wise right now, do you have any idea approximately how many calories you're eating a day right now? Yeah. So I, um, I'll go between like 1800 to 2200 a day. I try to stay within that, within that range. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's on the higher end, sometimes it's on the lower end. Um, I feel good about, about that. Um, Mainly, I eat a lot of it in the morning um, just because uh, that's when I'm most hungry. And then I'll kind of eat later in the day for dinner. Um, but yeah, right around in there. Yeah, that's, that's not a bad, that's not a bad calorie, uh, you know, place to be in. I, you know, do you have our intuitive nutrition guide, Nicole? Um, I don't have that. You guys sent me the Maps Prime Pro last time. And so I started to use that, um, which I really love. Okay. Um, my husband even you now <laughs> with okay. me, so. Perfect. Well, I'm going to send you the intuitive nutrition guide because I think it's going to help you with the, oh no, am I getting bigger? Is it body fat? Is it muscle? It's going to help you with that internal dialogue quite a bit because the, the intuitive nutrition guide really does help you focus on the the signs that you want to focus on and take your, your, your I guess, your focus off the of things that can often mess with our heads a little bit. It's so we'll send that over to you. Go through it. I think it'll help you out. Okay. Um, and then just one last thing before I let you guys go, can I kick back into doing <laughs> to like some deadlifts or like, I mean, I did, I've kind of thrown them in there now and then, but I was 
because I started to get bored. So I was like, I'm going to do like, you know, some <laughs> double leg exercises. So, um, do you guys have any good, like, can I start, like, I want to kind of start doing some more. Um, I'm just not sure which ones would be the best in this situation. Well, I'll, look, if, if you were my client, it, okay, because we're dealing with not just an imbalance, but an actual short, a leg that is shorter than the other. Right. I would almost always train you unilaterally. Yes. That's yes. just 100%. Yeah. I, I don't well, think I would ever have you focus on okay. bilateral exercise. Now, it's okay to throw them in every once in a while. Real life involves bilateral movements, so you still want to do them here and there because obviously in real life, you know, it doesn't care if one leg is short than the other. So you're still going to okay. practice those, but I would almost entirely always do unilateral work because that's, what's going to benefit you the most. Maybe, maybe an exercise or two a week tops that yeah. you throw in, you know, a couple sets here or there, but the program, what we talked about last time, staying focused on unilateral. I mean, you can develop and strengthen and, and oh, build. Oh, you get a great you, physique. Yeah, you yeah. can you can pretty much do everything you need to do by training that way. And in your case, it is it is what is best for your body. It doesn't mean that you can't play with it here and there. And you know, oh, let's just see. I've been doing single leg for a while. I wonder mm -hmm. how strong my regular bilateral deadlift would be today. I'm going to do three sets of it at the end of my workout or sometime in my routine just to kind of check up on yourself. That's fine. But honestly, with that that imbalance like that, it, it's just not ideal for you. you you're you only risking Yeah, that's it. novelty for you in yeah. this instance. So yeah, I agree. It's, it's just going to benefit you more to kind of stay as much as you can in, in unilateral. All right. Well, not the answer I wanted to hear, but that's okay. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'll, I'll, you, 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 know, you, you know. did, you, hold on, Nicole. You did what we said last time and what happened? Yeah. I know. I mean, as long as I'm seeing the strength, I'm seeing, you know, my legs getting bigger and like, you know, better. So obviously I know it works, but you know, you get kind of in your head. And of course. You yep. Well, of course. you can, you can also, I mean, uh, you don't have to stick to the same unilateral exercises though. I mean, you can start to get creative right. and, and, yeah. tr and try new things and challenge your body in different ways too, though. Yeah. Like, are you, are, like, are you, uh, are you playing with a Turkish get up at all? Um, no, I, I have before in the past when I used to do like boot camp um, classes and it's just, it was, it's really difficult for me to get up on with one, one leg from the ground like that on one side, but the other side I could do fine, but I just found it really challenging. And so I'm kind of one of those like people where I found it challenging. So I was like, screw this exercise and threw it out uh, where well, I, I, I got some more advice for you. You don't want to listen to, or you don't want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should practice it's speaking. To I you. think you should practice Turkish getups on the side that you, that's, that you struggle with. That's I, right. I think you should practice them every day, just five to 10 minutes. Cause I tell you, I swear to God, Nicole, if you practice the movements that you feel like you can't do with that one side and you get good at them, the, what you're going to get back from it, I can't even explain how much of a benefit you're going to get from that. It's going to change everything. Everything gets stronger. Yes. Yeah. No, I know. I've seen it happen over the last couple of months. So I, I, I trust you guys just getting in and getting excited to practice it every day. But Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks for calling in. This is the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. This is two months in. You haven't seen anything yet. So stay stay on the okay. course. Thanks yeah. for the update. That's Doing great, great Nicole. Right, guys, appreciate it. Thank you. All Thank right. you. Yeah, you know, I uh I've trained have you guys ever trained anybody where they mm -hmm. had an actual anatomical Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had a I've had a couple clients. I had one client who couldn't fully extend one arm. Yeah. And then I had somebody had with a frozen shorter shoulder leg. and yeah, yeah and it's just things. you know when you're talking about an ana anatomical thing that you can't change like you can't make her leg longer right, right? Yeah. unilateral all the time there's there's always 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 unilateral and you get exceptional results because yeah, you way. have to understand that anytime she does a deadlift you know everything she, else is compensated yeah mm -hmm. she's got a she's got a one inch raise on one side which is going to run all the way up the connect chain that's going to asymmetrical shift yeah constantly so gotta deal with. every time and like you said it, it doesn't hurt to, to test it every once in a while just because real life she was on both feet she'll have to pick a couch up or a kid or do yeah. something with so it's not a bad idea to make sure you still have the capability of doing stuff with that but unilateral you know, training all the way for and then that's why i brought up the turkish get up too because such a great movement that's going to highlight the it's going to highlight any left oh, to right imbalance. Left to right mm -hmm. discrepancy. Yeah. And just a, a, a challenge, very challenging exercise for someone to do. And that's a great way to keep her interested in trying to get better and improve. Because I do understand that, you know, you 
train a certain way only for a while, even if it is what's best for you, you get bored and feel like you mm-hmm. need something new or different. Well, you know, add a yeah. movement like That'll that. That'll add a great skill for her. Hell yeah. yeah but so it, it was funny. As, as soon as she's like, yeah, but I couldn't really get up on one side. And yeah. right away I'm like, oh, yeah, well, that's what you got to do. <laughs> that's what you got to practice. You want to find those moments. Our next caller is Pam from Oregon. Pam, what's going on? How can we help you? Hi, guys. Um, Thanks for taking my questions. I actually have three, but we can take them one by one just to make sure the timing works out. Okay. Um, So quick background. I started working out seriously about two, three years ago, and I've been rock climbing for about three, four years now. And I always hated cardio with all my heart. Um, My goal for now is just getting stronger, mostly to assist my climbing skills. So listening to your podcast, it felt very liberating to understand that's not a necessity for better health. Um, however, when I go on hikes and backpacking and everything, I can feel the lack of endurance. It's hard to keep up with um, my friends who are much better. Um, so I'd like to keep some form of cardio just for that. Um, yeah. Right now, I usually finish my workouts with just a 15 minutes high intensity training cycling session. Um, However, so from what I've learned from you guys, the signals leveraged by strength training and cardio are kind of antagonists. So my question is, um, am I impeding on the outcomes of my workouts when I wrap it up with a short, high intensity cardio session? Mm. Yeah, probably not. No, okay, so here's, I want to be clear here with, the, with that message of the competing signals. If the cardio is improving your health and if it improves your ability, your work capacity, it can actually help you build muscle. Okay. So if you got like a, let's, I'm going to paint a picture. This is not you, but let me just paint a picture. You got a dude only interested in building muscle. All he does is lift weights and feed himself a lot of food. And as a result, his stamina goes way down. He starts to suffer in his workouts. He's breathing hard just when he's bench pressing, but he doesn't want to do any cardio because he doesn't want to prevent himself from gaining muscle. Okay. In that case, a little cardio would improve his health and would actually help him build a little bit of muscle. So it does depend on the individual. Now, you did mention that one of the reasons why you want to do this is that you notice when you go hiking and stuff with your friends, you're losing some stamina. The best thing you could do if you want that kind of stamina is to practice more of that. So I would do the hiking as part of your routine, if possible, to give you that endurance and stamina. Otherwise, what you're doing on the bike is probably absolutely fine. Of course, we have to look at everything. So If you're on the border of overtraining and you throw that in, it might be too much. But if you're fine and you're noticing that you're recovering fine, I don't think it's a problem to do what you're doing. It's fine, but it's not really going to help what you're trying to do, right? If you go for a hike, I'm assuming you don't, with your friends, sprint for 30 seconds and then walk with them and then sprint for 30 seconds while then you guys stop at 15 minutes. Like... So your yeah, body's going to get good at whatever you do. So if if that's the only form of cardio and then you do these long, you know, three mile, five mile hikes or you're rock climbing for two or three hours and you're getting gassed and fatigued, well, it's because you haven't trained the body to get good at that. And so actually dedicating, you know, a day or two a week to a, you know, longer, lower intensity type of cardio session is going to benefit that. Um, and like Sal said, it, it's it's such a hard thing for us to communicate on this podcast because we come off like we're, we're anti-cardio. It's just that it, it, it really depends what the main goal is. Your goal is very specific here. You want to be strong and you want to build muscle, but then you also need to be able to go on these long hikes or long bouts of climbing. And so as a, as a trainer who's programming for you, I've got a program there that even if it means mm-hmm. we get, you know, one tenth less muscle building this month. It's okay because I, you also are doing this other thing. If you were that example, Sal said, and you, all you cared about was, I just want to add muscle, add muscle. Well, then maybe I'm a little more reluctant to add cardio in there. But for someone who who needs it for what you're trying to do, I'm, abs- I'm absolutely going to program something that mirrors what you want to do. Obviously, the most ideal would be get out and go do a hike that would be just like the hike you're going to do with your friends once or twice a week. Otherwise, you can try and uh, imitate that inside the gym, doing it maybe on the stairmaster. If it's a performance thing, if you can emulate it around like what you actually want to, you know, have endurance for, uh, that would be the ideal situation. But yeah, to to that point, it's (laughs) you need a gas tank in order to kind of fuel you for a lot of these other extracurricular activities. So there's a way to kind of incorporate that and train that. And so uh, it. In terms of competing, you might, you know, compete, you know, a little bit in terms of just like focusing directly on building muscle. But, uh, you know, for, for that reason, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, it'd be a good workout program for you. Map strong. 
I think Map Strong would probably oh, yeah, give you work capacity. Yeah, that would give you that would give you some of that because the work sessions in Map Strong are they, they they do require some stamina, for sure. So if you if you don't have that program, we can send it to you and you can give that one a try. I like that. But that one's that one's going to help you across the board, I think. In, in terms and, of what you're and then just uh, just make sure you do a good job. Like I love to get um, some good liquid calories before I go on like like if a, a bout of cardio like this because your goal. It isn't about leaning. You're not. You're not doing cardio to get leaner or drop weight. You're doing cardio for performance reasons. And so, make sure you're you're fed well. You know, make sure you go into those bouts of of cardio with a good amount of calories. I like to do some liquid calories about 30 minutes in before I go into it, and then make sure that I replenish right away. So as soon as I'm done with that bout, I'm replenishing with some calories uh, right away. That will also help. Uh, mitigate any potential, you know, muscle loss from from the reduction or the increase of in uh, of movement and intensity. Yeah, it's, that's a. I'm I'm very curious about the map strong too. That's um, I definitely want to check it out. Cool. You said you had some other questions. Yes. So um, the second one is completely unrelated. So I said I, I I was rock climbing and I noticed consistently that after like a two hour session, I can do um, my max is about eight pull ups. Um, pretty easily. And whenever I go to the gym and I try to repeat that just to make sure I get um, the pull-ups reps in, I can never reach even half of that. I, I get so weak, even though I I do some of the upper body workouts before, and I can never figure out how what it is. I thought it was maybe activation, like I tried to do some lat pull-downs. Um, it doesn't really help. I'm, I'm just... Uh, and it's very consistent. I don't think it's like a anecdotal. So, do you have any, Do you have an experience with that? Or do you know what I can do to make sure that I max out every time I go to the gym? Yeah, I mean, it, it, boy, there's there could be so many different factors. You know, what did you do the day before? Are you working out your about your strength training your upper body before you attempt some of these pull ups? But also, generally speaking, if you want to get better at pull ups, both at the gym and at w when you're rock climbing. One of the best things you could do, Pam, is to practice pull-ups every day. Now, you said your max is seven to eight at the rock climbing gym and about three or four at the gym gym when you're working out. I would mm -hmm. say do like two pull-ups, you know, every three hours. Like get a pull-up bar in your house and do like one or two pull-ups. Just easy. Practice them every single day. It's the fastest way I've ever seen people improve their strength in a specific movement. It, mm. it, literally, it works really quickly. But the intensity needs to be low. So, you know, if you could do four or five... Two, you just get up on the pull-up bar, do two reps, jump back down, go about your day. A couple hours later, try it again. Do this every single day, you know, maybe four times throughout the day, and you'll notice it, you know, how much stronger you get. And then don't increase those reps until after like six weeks. Even mm. if two now feels super easy, just keep practicing. Just I say two. stay with the amount of reps, increase the tension. So uh, in terms of like quality of reps and being able to kind of like, I know a lot of times with pull-ups, sometimes there's a leak in performance. So if, you know, you have any kind of body part that's loose, you know, you got any swing that you have to address. I mean, isometrics in general too for, you know, rock climb is going to be hugely beneficial. Uh, but to, to really be able to have that ability to tense your entire body, your core and stay tight and controlled uh, and just try to rep it out as, you know, the, the best quality reps you can possibly do. You're going to add, you know, a lot of benefits to that in terms of technique. Uh, to add on to Justin's advice, something you can play with that'll be fun for you to try out if you've never done this before is find a weight that is heavy for you to deadlift like five reps, like a really heavy uh, deadlift weight and do one to two reps of that for two to three sets before you go into your pull-ups and then go to your pull-ups and see what you notice. Mm, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. But so when I do the pull-ups every day, I really don't chase fatigue, right? No. It's just no. you know, you're right? literally practicing them. Yeah. Literally, you're just jumping up, doing a couple, come back down, go about your day. Okay. Okay. Um, interesting. And then the last one, um, it's uh, kind of related to some some of the things I've learned on your podcast, which is um, switching up tempo and rhythm in general to try to break plateaus. And I was wondering if there is any um, advantages of switching up also the tempo and a number of reps and the load also across sets within a same session or those variations should really be kept for um, breaking up plateaus after maybe a few weeks of doing the same. Yeah. Physiologically, it doesn't really make a difference. Uh, your body's going to adapt well doing both. Psychologically, doing one particular style for three weeks and then switching tends to work better because 
you know, shorter rest periods, for example, or faster pace. It's a different mentality. It's a different psychology going to your workout when you're lifting heavy and you're resting long versus when you're doing supersets or versus when you're doing bodybuilding versus when you're doing powerlifting. And switching the mentalities quickly from set to set often results in uh, subpar results. It, it often results in like, well, I'm kind of, I like one better than the other. So my mindset's in there and I'm going to get this one done because I need to versus three weeks. I know, cause here's what I, what, ha what happens to me when I'm in a particular phase of training for three weeks, the first couple workouts, I'm not fully in it psycho psychologically. And then after that, I'm really into it and I get really good at that mental part of the training, but physiologically really no difference. Studies will show that it doesn't make that big of a difference. Uh, either way, it also it also makes it more difficult to measure uh, which tempo or what rep range or what rest period uh, is benefiting you the most at that time. So if you're kind of like mixing it all up in in a single workout or changing it day to day, it's hard to see that. Oh wow, I notice when I do these rest periods or I do this tempo. Yeah, was it the slow one or the fast one? Right, this, it's or? it's really hard for you to measure. That's really because they've done studies where they have people mix it up every single day and then people stay very consistent for two to three weeks. And the results are very, very close. I mean, it's splitting uh, splitting hairs is the difference. But we always talk about the psychological piece or the behavior piece. And when we're coaching and training clients, it's just easier to stay focused on one tempo or one rep range for a, an extended period of time so that you can just better can evaluate, evaluate it. it. You yeah. can look at it at the end of the week and go like, oh, wow, that – I could feel the difference from changing my tempo to this to that versus if you're doing that every other day or in a workout, uh, the exercise, it's really tough to to measure that. I just think the psychological benefits of like being able to see or feel yep. the change uh, helps out. Totally. That makes a lot of sense. Um, thank you guys so yeah. much. Thanks for calling, thank you, Pam. Pam. Right. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's, um, you know, and there's a theme oftentimes with, certain questions. And one of the things that comes up often for us is like, I want multiple things. Yeah. Right. How do I train for multiple things? Now, this is a general statement, but it's, I think it's true kind of across the board, which is if you focus on one thing, one goal, you get a lot of that goal and you get a little bit of other goals that you're not focused on. If you mm -hmm. focus on a lot of goals, you get some of all of those goals, but you get, you don't get a lot of any of them. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a compromise and that's okay. And that's the mental piece. Like, okay, I'm going to train for strength and endurance. I can't go into it thinking I want my strength to be my PR all the time. That's like, that's the wrong mentality. Yeah. Wow, I also want to be better at cardio. Yeah, it's, it's just, just like it's just not going to work. And then as far as cardio is concerned, again, if it improves your general health, it can have an, a, a benefit, beneficial effect on muscle building. When we talk about cardio in some of the ways that we do, we're talking to the cardio fanatics. They overdo it or that's the cornerstone of the routine right. and they just want to lose body fat, in which case it's not a great long-term strategy. That's what we constantly communicate, but we're not anti-cardio. All of us do some form of cardiovascular conditioning or training at some point or another to complement our strength training and, our, and improve our quality of life. So we got to be very clear with and that. I, and I really think that if, if that she was just trying to improve the quality of her life and, you know, have some sort of, uh, you know cardio uh, abilities, the 15 minute high intensity thing is a great way to do it after your workout. But she has something even more specific. She's rock climbing yeah. or she's hiking. Yeah, for go hike. Yeah. For an extended period of time and training that way isn't going to help that that much. It'll help it a little bit, but not that much because it's not specific enough to what she's Dude, doing. I tell you what, um, this is so true, right? It's, strength is very specific. Stamina can also be very specific. Like I remember sp mm -hmm. like for personally, when I was really heavy into training jujitsu, sometimes, rarely, we would cross train and we get a boxing coach in there or a Muay Thai coach. And I could roll for an hour with different people on the ground and I would build all the stamina and I have no problem doing it. Then I'd go hit the pads and I'd gas out after 15 minutes, not even 15 minutes, 10 minutes. Yep. And I remember thinking, what the hell? And I'm like, well, this is different. Completely different monster. It, yeah. It, it's a different monster. I mean, it's a very similar example, but like running lines on the field where it's everything's flat and controlled versus now I'm running uphill. Like yeah. that was a complete different experience. And, and yeah, it's very specific to what you're doing. Totally. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free guides. We have tons of free guides that we wrote and created to help you with your fitness goals. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump Sal. And Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. 